Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wonder Goal, the soccer betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Lieboff, and joining me today is BJ Cunningham. Anthony DeBundo is on vacation. Uh, I think he's at the Big East tournament or something like that. Uh, either way, we will trudge on without his insight for a loaded weekend of uh, Premier League action. Uh, right off the top, we do have to say there are four Premier League games on Thursday. We are recording this on Wednesday night uh, in order to get this out on Thursday morning. Those matches are Norwich City versus Chelsea, Wolves versus Watford, Saints versus Newcastle, and Leeds versus Aston Villa. Uh, but we will still do our best to uh, handicap every match that we can um, and get you prepared for the upcoming weekend of soccer action. And we will start uh, with a 12.30 p.m. kickoff on Saturday between Manchester United, they're plus 115 at Old Trafford, hosting Tottenham Hotspur, who are plus 245. The draw for this one is plus 250. On the surface, it seems like a pretty classic buy low, sell high spot. Spurs coming off a 5-0 drubbing of Everton, who basically didn't show up uh, to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on Monday. And Manchester United, they got played off the park by their inner city rivals, Manchester City, in a not-so-close loss on in the Manchester Derby. Uh, and, and United struggled with, with good sides this season. I think we've been talking about how we were skeptical of their improved metrics for a while because they were playing such a soft schedule. And if you look at how they've done against the big boys of the Premier League, like Manchester City, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal, I mean, even Watford. Uh, they've struggled with Watford too. Just kidding. Uh, the United's just, their numbers aren't that good. BJ, I, I actually think Spurs is the value side on this one. We'll see where this market goes, but plus 245 for me, I think is enough to get in on Tottenham. Oh yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's it's a little bit too low for me to play. Instead, I'm going to be looking at the, the total over two and a half goals of minus 130. I mean, the matches against Atletico and Man City have just truly shown that this Manchester United team hasn't changed a bit, really, from Rangnick, uh, from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. They got completely dominated in the Manchester Derby on Sunday. They did not have a shot. For the entire second half, allowed City four goals, 2.7 expected goals. It was just a really bad performance. On the flip side, Tottenham, now their defense isn't anywhere near the level of Manchester City. Sure, they beat Everton 5 0 on Monday. And look, I mean, we can try to sugarcoat it all we want, but it was just a bad performance by Everton. But Spurs have allowed uh, 11.2 expected goals in their seven previous matches from the one uh, against Everton. And only two of those opponents were actually in the top seven. So facing Manchester United is going to be a step up in competition overall for the season. Tottenham is 13th in shots allowed per 90 and 10th in big scoring chances allowed. They're also not a great pressing team. They're only 10th in passes per defensive action, 17th in pressure success rate, and actually have the fewest high turnovers in the Premier League. That's huge for Manchester United, who has really struggled to play through pressure uh, this season. United, they should be getting Ronaldo back, it looks like, on Saturday, which obviously will be a big boost uh, for them, even though they have played a relatively easy schedule under Rangnick. Still 1.6 expected goals per match. I I have around 3.3 goals projected. So it is, uh, you know, a tad, tad pricey, over two and a half goals at minus 130. Both teams of score is also uh, pretty pricey at minus 155. But both of them, I would be willing to pay that type of price because I don't see – anything other than chaos in this match, given how not only good Tottenham's offense has been, how talented Man United's offense has been, but how shaky Man United has looked defensively. And also Tottenham, even at uh, the Beverton match, even they Toffees did create a few chances here and there, but especially against bigger sides, Tottenham has allowed a ton of chances. So over two and a half goals and minus 130 is where I'm going. Yeah, a pretty good live betting match too. If the Spurs go back, go down early, I think I – will be in on them again um, because I don't trust Manchester United to hold the lead at all. Um, all right, we'll move to Saturday morning. The 7.30 a.m. Kick, kick kickoff is Brighton. They're at home, plus 5.50, hosting Liverpool, minus 205. The draw here is plus 370. Uh, Liverpool's long unbeaten streak came to an end against Inter Milan in the Champions League. They lost 1-0 uh, at Anfield. That was their first home loss in about a, a year, and – it kind of drove home at the point that I was making in our Champions League podcast, which is that these these performances are starting to show from Liverpool. And I think going against them will finally pay off. And I know I sound like a broken record. Uh, they are still maybe the second best team in the world, sure. But they're giving up scoring chances. They're getting by against teams like 
like West Ham and uh, they had to come from behind against Norwich City. There are just some cracks showing on the defensive side of the ball. Some defensive regression is coming for this team and they struggle with Brighton, uh, who is an underdog that likes to punch up and they do it very well. We like to bet on Brighton when they're at big prices on the show and I'll be doing it again. Uh, this season at Anfield, they drew 1-1 with Brighton. The expected goals were basically split down the middle. Uh, and over the past two seasons, Brighton has actually won 2-0, and win, draw, loss against Liverpool. So you're giving me plus 550 against a team that has kind of turned into a bogey team for Liverpool um, at home. Uh, I'll take it, despite the fact that Brighton has really struggled lately. They're 0-0-4, win, draw, loss, uh, with a minus eight goal differential, nine goals against one goal four. However, there is some uh, some that number is a little inflated. Those numbers are a little inflated. They sh- expected goals has them expected goals for um, they should suggest they should have four goals over that span. And I've only allowed six and a half, still not good, but better than what their actual results are. So I'll take a shot. Brighton uh, bet anything better than five to one for me. I like the Seagulls. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to end up passing on this one. That match against Liverpool early in the season was really interesting because Liverpool actually went up two nothing and Brighton just started to control the possession. They started to control the midfield and they really created two really nice chances and ended up drawing two, two. If you go back to that though, Liverpool was without a lot of their central midfielders. So there's a lot of chances for Brighton with their build-up play to, you know, take advantage of Liverpool's midfield. Obviously Liverpool is healthy now, but they have to be exhausted. I mean, this is their fourth match in 10 days. I understand Klopp now has a ton of depth and he can rotate a lot of guys, but still it's, it's a tough, it's a really, it's really a sandwich spot because obviously playing inter, uh, on Tuesday, and then they've got Arsenal on Wednesday. So big time sandwich spot going on the road. Uh, my projections, I have this pretty much dead on. I have Liverpool at around minus 195, the total set right at three. So there really isn't much value for me. Brighton, it, it's tough, you know, losing four straight and losing the expected goals battle in all four uh, against some pretty weak competition outside of Manchester United is a little bit concerning for the Seagulls. They're starting to drop a little bit in the table, but they're going to be comfortably uh, mid table for the rest of the season. So, uh, definitely if I was going to play anything, it would probably be Brighton, but since my projections have this right on, I'll be passing. The only, there's only one 10 AM kickoff on Saturday because of the, the scheduling wonkiness from the Omicron surge. There's a game at 7 30 AM Saturday, 10 AM on Saturday, 12 30 PM on Saturday, and then a bunch of 10 AM starts on Sunday. And we also have Monday night football. So the only 10 AM game is, uh, Brentford, and Burnley in a relegation six pointer. The bees are plus one fifteen. Burnley comes back plus two sixty on the road. The draw here is plus two thirty. Uh, this let's set up the relegation battle right as it stands. What a bunch of these teams are playing on Thursday. Newcastle they have twenty eight points from twenty six games. The the bees Brentford they're twenty seven points from twenty eight games. The then we got Leeds twenty three points from twenty seven games. Everton twenty two points from twenty five games. Burnley twenty one. From 26 there in 18th, Watford 19th with 19 points in 27 games played. Norwich City 17 points from 27 games played. Norwich, Watford, Newcastle, and Leeds are all playing on Thursday. So this could look different by the time you're listening to this. However, um, I think this is a pretty good spot to get in on Brentford. I think we're starting to see them turn a corner a little bit here. And I want to beat the market to it, even though this number isn't that great. It's only, you know, it's it's not a huge number. That said, um, you know, you're getting plus money at home against a, the team that's in 18th place in the, the league. So maybe it's nothing to thumb your nose at. Burnley's uh, lost two in a row, six goals against, zero goals for. Uh, the expected goals suggest that those numbers are a little inflated. However, um, it's just not a great matchup for Burnley, uh, except for the fact that Brentford does have trouble defending set pieces. I do trust the Bees and their um slight uptick in form. They did show something. Christian Eriksen should make a difference. Ivan Tony looks to be back in form as well. So I think we're going to be getting a more, a, a performance from Brentford that looks more like the team we saw in September and October than the one we've seen in uh, the winter. Absolutely. You hit the nail right on the head. It's that this is just the, the match against Norwich was one of those finally, like finally Brentford put together a big performance. I understand they had a couple of penalties in there, but still it was the culmination of a ton of overdue positive regression for the bees. Since their bad run started back on January 11th, they've picked up only four points in nine matches, but based on expected points, they should have around a little over 10. So they're still due for more of that positive regression regression. The return of Ivan Tony is, is so he's just so important 
for their attack. He's got a 0.52 XG plus expected assist per 90 minute rate, which is the best on the team and is in the top 20 in the Premier League. Burnley back to back, pretty bad defensive performances for them. You know, the Chelsea match for the first half, it, they looked to be in it, and then Chelsea kind of put them away in the second, but still not a great defensive performance. Just back to back sloppiness from Burnley in both those matches. This is another pretty good spot here for, for Brentford to surge here offensively. The biggest thing, though, is the home road splits. We've talked about Brentford and Burnley just at nauseum, the home road splits. Brentford plus 2.2, expect a goal differential home. Burnley minus 11, expect a goal differential on the road. So I have Brentford projected at minus 114. So uh, I like I definitely have some value on the Bs at plus 115. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. kickoff between Chelsea. They're minus 320, hosting Newcastle. Plus 950 on the road. The draw here is four plus 450. Both teams in action on Thursday. Chelsea host, uh, taking on Norwich City at Carroll Road. Uh, Newcastle will be traveling south to uh, Southampton. So not a great spot for Newcastle in terms of travel. But um, I think this is an interesting spot to take on Chelsea. They'll be looking ahead to a Champions League game in the midweek coming up. Newcastle has been better. I think they've been much better than I've expected. I've been wrong on them all season, or at least since Eddie Howe took over. And I think that this is a game where Chelsea, they're pretty comfortable in their spot. It's not, they're kind of playing out the string in the champ in the premier league. They could rotate their squad to keep them fresh for the uh, champions league, especially if they get the win against North city uh, as we all expect them on Thursday. So I think uh, you're getting a pretty big number on Newcastle and it's one that I'm probably not going to look away from at plus nine fifty. So I'll be on the magpies money line. I think, maybe for the second time all season, I'll be betting on Newcastle and uh, don't feel good about it, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Obviously, since we're taping this before the Thursday matches, I'm very, very, I'm not really interested to see what happens with Chelsea and Norwich. It is what it is. Unless obviously Norwich pulls off some crazy upset, but I'm very interested to see what Newcastle does against Southampton because since their recent resurgence, uh, since the January transfer window, when they brought in pretty much a hundred million dollars worth of players, they've had a pretty easy schedule. They've played Watford, Leeds, Everton, West Ham, Aston Villa, Brentford, Brighton, and then Southampton on Thursday. So they haven't really faced the top side. I'm very interested to see how they'll deal with that because they're trying to switch to a 4-3-3. They're trying to play more possession-based, which they've done their last two matches. But how are they going to be out of possession? Are they going to fall back into the normal Newcastle 4-4-2 under Steve Bruce? Or are they going to try to play with Chelsea in the 4-3-3 and play up-tempo. I think that would be a recipe for disaster for Norwich. Uh, the last time these two teams faced, it was, you know, obviously things have changed quite a bit, but Newcastle did absolutely nothing for the whole match. Chelsea beat them 3-0 at St. James Park. Newcastle had 0.3 expected goals. Chelsea outpassed them 779 to 227 Newcastle only had six shots so I'm pretty much dead on with the market here with my projections so I'm happy to pass maybe taking a look at an under but uh, other than that uh, I'm just very interested to see how Newcastle is going to perform against one of the top sides. Leeds United and North City another relegation six-pointer Leeds is minus 170 their odds on at home taking on North City plus 450 the draw is plus 340 the market I think in this match, maybe more than any other one with that will be affected by Thursday. This one can move a lot um, after we record this because Leeds is playing Villa and Leeds looked pretty good under Jesse Marsh in their first game against Leicester. So good performance from Leeds. And this number could actually balloon even further, which is interesting since they are uh, already minus 170, despite the fact that they are in uh, 16th place in the table. However, uh, this matchup, I think, sets up pretty well for the Peacocks. And I like that taking them on an all spread minus one and a half minus two and a half, whatever you float your boat minus one and a half right now, I think it's plus plus one forty three. I saw. And the reason I like that is because I think they're going to win this game and in true Leeds United fashion, if they do win this game, it's probably going to come by multiple goals against a team that shouldn't be able to take advantage of Leeds biggest bugaboo, which is their defense. North city's uh, attack has been awful all season. So in terms of a matchup, can't get better than this for basically anybody because it's Norwich City. Um, and I'd rather take the big price on something than, um, you know, just lay it with Leeds or throw them in a money line parlay. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, I'm, I'm on Leeds minus one uh, at even money. This is one of those situations where, since obviously we're recording this before, but on Thursday, what I usually do in a situation like this, where I know that 
the Leeds number could potentially get a lot better or a lot worse considering they're basically a pick up against Aston Villa. I'm going to have that lead spread open during the match. If, if they go up or they look are starting to look really good in the first half, it's automatic fire on leads. If they start to stumble or maybe Aston Villa gets ahead on a couple low quality chances, I'll probably wait for the end of the match and see if the market overreacts to that and potentially get leads at a better number. I don't think you're going to, I don't think the Norwich Chelsea match is really going to affect this number at all, but very similar to that. I'm, I'm waiting on to see what happens with Leeds. I mean, they look so good under Jesse Marsh that first match. So this is a really good opportunity, I think, to get it at a cheaper price. I mean, we can, we've said it so many times and we've said it in so many different iterations, but New Kent, Norwich is just horrible. Like there's just really no other way to describe how bad they are. Offensively, they're now in dead last in non-penalty expected goals by a pretty considerable margin. They're dead last in shots per 90 and big scoring chances. In fact, they haven't created a big scoring chance in their last five matches. Their defense has also been really bad the last five, 13.6 expected goals allowed in those, in those matches. They're near the bottom in the Premier League at playing through pressure, which is not a good matchup against Leeds, who actually, in their first match under Jesse March, I mentioned it in the last podcast, had pressed around 190 times in the match, which is well above the average they were doing under Bielsa. So Leeds being at Ellen road where they're much better, only around a minus three expected goal differential versus minus 13 on the road. I think this is a really good spot for them with the new manager bounce under Jesse Marsh. I have Leeds projected around minus 1.2. So I minus one at even money. I think you're getting decent value on the Peacocks. Yeah. There's not much, uh, we can really say to, to keep summing up how bad North city is, but they're bad. Good on them for, Hanging, they should have been out of this race, I think, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. Uh, but good for them, uh, stay, sticking around. West Ham are plus 120 favorites hosting Aston Villa, plus 245. The draw here is plus 240. Aston Villa in action on Thursday. And I think, uh, an interesting spot in terms of a matchup, uh, Aston Villa's offense doesn't really create much. They're 19th in big chances created in the Premier League this season, and that's how you you should be taking advantage against uh, West Ham whose defense can be a little bit leaky. However, they're getting healthier. Uh, and I think their performance against Liverpool kind of showed that like Brent, like I was talking about with Brentford, we're starting to see a more um, performances from West Ham closer to what we saw when they were uh, at their peak. We're not saying that we're going to see them, you know, pull up, pull the results like they did when they beat Liverpool uh, in November, but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that they're starting to round back into form as well. So I'm closer to West Ham here, but the number is not big enough for me uh, because I just don't really think that Villa is going to be able to create enough. Yeah, West Ham is starting to trend in the right direction offensively, you know, after a couple of really like four straight dud performances in January, 3.4 expected goals in their last two matches against Wolves and Liverpool. However, this situation isn't the best for them. They're traveling to Sevilla for a Europa League match on Thursday night, and then they have to fly back for this one on Sunday. Also, it looks like at the time of taping this that Jared Bowen is going to be out for West Ham, and that's just absolutely detrimental to their offense. 0.53 XG plus expected assists per 90 minutes. That's by far the best rate on the team. Uh, similar to the Newcastle Southampton match, I'm very interested, interested to see how Aston Villa plays on Thursday against Leeds because if they can back up their tremendous offensive performance from the weekend against Southampton, then maybe Gerard has them headed in the right direction. But they have been overperforming offensively under him, 23 goals off of only 18 expected. So with the travel for West Ham, with Bowen being out, it's a pass for me on the money line, potentially maybe looking uh, at under, under two and a half goals is at a minus 105 right now. Again, I'm going to wait and see what the Aston Villa performance looks like uh, on Thursday. And if it's a complete dud offensively and it's uh, a low event type game against Leeds, which, you know, don't really, doesn't really happen when you play Leeds United. I might be firing on uh, under two and a half goals at minus 105. Southampton are minus 165 hosting Watford plus 425. The draw here is plus 330. Both teams in action on Thursday. Watford's defense, we've still talked about it. It's improving under Roy Hodgson, and they found a way to score two goals against Arsenal uh, last weekend. So who knows uh, what, what's going to come out of that offense uh, and any given day. Usually it's a dud, but they just pull out these performances out of nowhere. Uh, I think this game is sets up with both teams playing on Thursday. And then so playing again, in short rest and Watford would be, would bite your hand off for a draw in uh, on the road at saints. 
I think that this sets up for Roy Hodgson putting 10 people behind the ball, slow, trying to sl- do his best to slow Southampton down, just give them the ball, which I don't think Southampton necessarily wants. They're a team that loves to press and counterattack. So it just feels like it's going to be an ugly, ugly match. And I think it's a recipe for success for a draw better. And it's north of three to one plus three thirty. So I'm going there. Yeah. I'm kind of there with you. It's uh, it's, it's not a great spot for both either team, obviously having to play on short rest, but especially for Watford having to travel in back-to-back matches, I'll probably wait and see what happens on Thursday with both of these before playing this. But I think there's definitely some value on Watford here. I try not to overweight motivation and handicapping matches until we get to the very end of the season. And that's basically when the market just drastically overreacts to teams that have to play for something and teams that don't. But Southampton is pretty comfortably in the middle of the table. while, And they really have no shot of finishing inside the top seven. While Watford has absolutely everything to play for. Like you mentioned, they'd bite your hand off for a draw. Roy Hodgson, I agree with you. He's actually doing a really good job with Watford. And you can make the case that they're due for a little bit of positive regression. In his seven matches in charge, Watford has a minus 1.7 expected goal differential, but a minus six actual goal differential. In fact, his expected goal differential per 90 minutes is minus 0.23, which is drastically better than the last two managers who combined for minus 0.76 per 90 minutes. So, and Watford is actually in the top half of the Premier League in big scoring chances, which has been Southampton's bugaboo all season long. They've conceded the fourth most in the league. So, and if you look at any, pretty much any other projection model from 538 to info goal, nobody has Southampton over 54%, which is essentially minus 120. So there definitely is some value here on Watford. I love them on the spread plus one at minus 125, just from a pure market perspective. They had, at some point, they got to get a little bit of this positive regression and the job they're doing on Roy Hodgson, I think bodes really well for them at the St. Mary stadium on Sunday. I don't want to do it, but we got to, uh, let's talk about Everton. They're plus, let's 100. do it. <laughs> they're plus one thirty at home hosting wolves plus two thirty five. The draw is plus two twenty five. Uh, the relegation pressure is real on Frank Lampard's toffees. They have wolves and then Newcastle at home coming up. Uh, two huge matches that if anything less than four points is a disaster. Honestly, anything less than six is not good either. Uh, I do think they're catching wolves at a good time here, especially with uh, Everton at home where they looked much more comfortable uh, under Lampard. And just generally the, the question is for me, uh, uh, there's a couple of things. The Everton defense was shambolic again against Tottenham, but they were really good against Manchester City, and that game came at home. But City is a, a more of a lumbering uh, attack. They, they're not the kind of press and counter that take advantage of a mistake and be opportunistic like Tottenham is. And that is kind of how I feel, why I feel a little confident about this matchup against Wolverhampton. This uh, this offense is. I don't want to say they're toothless, but they are struggling only 3.1 expected goals in their last four matches, all losses. And they're not the type of team that's going to take advantage of this Everton, uh, the middle of the Everton defense, which whether it's Michael Keane, Jared Branthwaite, Mason Holgate, or Ben Godfrey, who is looking like he's healthy, which would be a huge, huge improvement over what we've seen. Um, I just don't think this Wolves uh, attack is the one that's going to punish Everton for the mistakes that they will inevitably, inevitably make. So I think it's Everton or nothing at this number, but uh, I don't know if I, I have the cojones to do it. Yeah, I'm there with you. It's definitely lean Everton here. That's the really the only play for this match. I mean, there's really no way to share code of what happened on Monday. I already said it, but I mean, it's just, it was just bad. Like it was just a really bad Everton performance. Now the question is, can they put that in the rear view mirror and, you know, get up for this match against Wolves? Because what I will say about Everton is a lot of their bad performances, like the one on Monday, have come against the top seven. And we've said it in the Premier League. There is a very clear top seven, and it is a pretty steep drop off from there, you know, with Wolves being sitting there in eighth place. Everton versus the top seven this season is averaging 0.73 expected goals per match and allowing 1.78. But against the rest of the Premier League, they're averaging 1.42 expected goals per match and only allowing 1.34. So they definitely have a good shot here. They will have the rest advantage over wolves who has to play on Thursday night on Thursday afternoon wolves. The negative aggression is hitting them in a big way. They've lost three straight matches and have lost the expected goals battle in nine of their last 10 matches. So definitely leaning Everton here. I do not like the number at plus plus one thirty. I have them projected at plus plus one fifty. 
I would prefer to get Everton uh, a draw, no bet at something like minus 110, minus 105. But if I can't get that, I'll ultimately just be passing on this one. The 12.30 p.m. kickoff on Sunday is your Arsenal Gunners there. Minus 200 hosting Leicester City. The draw here is plus 360. Arsenal has Liverpool coming up on Wednesday after, so a little bit of a look-ahead spot. However, there's plenty of reason to pay attention to this match with Arsenal gunning for the top four and playing well of late. I do think that it's it's another spot where you're getting a number that's way too high. Uh, on the favorite, Arsenal at minus 200 is a little rich. They're still giving up goals. Leicester, we know, can punish. They can do it quickly uh, on the counter. However, their defense, you can't trust them either. So it does set up for um, uh, what should be a back and forth affair. I think I'm going to sit back and wait and look to live bet this one. Uh, it, especially, if, I think especially if Leicester goes down early, you're going to get a big number on them. And there's a chance that this Arsenal defense is can be picked apart and Leicester can come back. So um, I'll, I'll be looking to live bet. Enjoy this one at 1230, hopefully after an Everton win. Um, but for the pregame market, nothing for me. Yeah, I, I actually like over three goals at plus 105. Arsenal's offense, I mean, I said it last week, it's, it's been one of the best in the Premier League oh, 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 So basically since the start of December. Last 10 matches averaging 2.1 expected goals per match. Not only that, but now they're inside the top five in the league in both shots per 90 and box entries. Now you get to face a lesser defense that continues to be one of the worst in the league. Last weekend, they allowed 1.9 expected goals and 19 shots to Leeds, but obviously ended up getting a clean sheet, actually back-to-back clean sheets for Leicester. Since Boxing Day, the Foxes have allowed 17.4 expected goals in nine matches. Johnny Evans is still injured, so that means Daniel Armati will continue to have to play out of position at center back, which clearly has not worked for the Foxes. Now, on the flip side of that, you saw it on Sunday. Arsenal's defense 10 has been a bit shaky. They've made a few mistakes here and there. They've conceded in three straight matches, so Leicester's offense which has been trending in the right direction, definitely should be able to create some big chances. We talk about it all the time with lesser set-piece issues. Leads the Premier League 13 set-piece goals allowed, while Arsenal, they scored nine goals off set-pieces this season. And also, neither team really presses at a very high rate, so there should be plenty of open space, plenty of opportunities in each final third for chances to be created. I have 3.2 goals projected, so at a price of uh, plus 105 on over three goals, uh, I think there's definitely some value there. And finally, we will wrap up the EPL portion of the program with Crystal Palace. They're nine to one at home hosting Manchester City minus three twenty. The draw here is plus four seventy five. This is Monday three p.m. Monday night football under the lights at Selhurst Park. City uh, on sixty nine points from twenty eight games played. Right behind them is Liverpool at sixty three points on twenty seven games played. They still have to play each other in April. Uh, and the goal differential separation right now is uh, Manchester City at plus fifty. Liverpool plus 51. So we do have a title race on our hands. Palace, of course, upset City uh, as 20 to 1, near 20 to 1 underdogs uh, a couple months ago. That was on the road. So revenge spot, if you want to look into it, City just took care of business in uh, the Champions League in a nil-nil draw against Sporting, which they won 5 nil in aggregate uh, and across the two legs. So I'm not too worried about the rest, especially since this is a Monday game. Um, tr- Palace is a tricky spot. I think we can both agree that Crystal Palace is... Uh, Compared to where they've been in, in seasons past, they are improved. They're not easy to break down. They're strong defensively. However, I just don't think they're going to have the ball enough. And they're, I mean, they're, I don't think they're going to score. So this is an under game to me. Uh, I honestly don't mind betting like an alt under, like maybe two and a half, or if it's at one, one and a half. I don't know. I, this, this screams one nil city win, like on a Riyad Mahrez, uh, PK in like the 30th minute or something, then they hold on. It just doesn't sound like these two teams, I don't think will create much of a, uh, an exciting affair. So in likelihood of either pass or an under for me, what about you? Well, I mean, I, I think the spot is fantastic for Crystal Palace playing into your, your, uh, your under narrative though, when Palace is behind this season, they're only allowing around 1.1 expected goals per 90 minutes. And they're also one of the best second half teams in the premier league. So potentially if you want to get in live on Palace, I think they have around a little over a plus five and a half expected goal differential in the second half. So if City goes up here, there is a potential to play Crystal Palace live, but I love them pregame plus one and a half at even money. 
We've talked about it a ton, but Crystal Palace at home is unbelievable. Fifth in the Premier League in expected goal differential. And most importantly, they have been really good against the big boys at home. Against Tottenham, West Ham, Liverpool, and Chelsea, the Eagles have a plus 2.4 expected goal differential in those four matches. And defensively at home this season, they're only allowing 0.89 XG per 90 minutes. So it's a really, really good team. And you mentioned it, the revenge angle. They did hand Manchester City one of their three losses in the Premier League this season, beat them 2 nothing. Now Man City did get a red card in the 45th minute, but Wilfred Zaha did score in the sixth minute, and then they ended up holding City to only 1.1 expected goals and one and only 14 shots. Man City, it's just they're just in weird form. We've said it like two or three times already, but just since the start of the new year, if you throw out the drubbing uh, against Norwich, City has a plus 0.88 expected goal differential per 90 minutes, which sounds really good. But when you compare it to their form of 20, all of 2021, since start of the 20, this season through 2021, they had a plus 1.83 expected goal differential per 90 minutes. And it's starting to kind of show in their level of play because it has dipped a tad. Additionally, the injury to Ruben Diaz is a blow. Obviously city has a ton of depth. So, you know, it's not the the biggest blow in the world, but he is clearing away their best center back. So it's going to have a little bit of effect. I only have Manchester City projected their spread projected at minus 1.07. So getting Crystal Palace at plus one and a half at at even money definitely uh, for me has some value. And I think it's just a really good spot for the Eagles, especially uh, on Monday, especially being it being on Monday. On to the Bundesliga now. We'll give out a pick in Germany. I like mines again. They were my team. Plus 180 on the road at Augsburg. Uh, Mines, second best team in the Bundesliga in expected goals against Augsburg. Their offense is near the bottom, uh, and so is their uh, their defense. So you're talking about a pretty good matchup against that on offense that shouldn't be able to um, pose much of a threat to both fence and side. So I think the number here is pretty good. I'd, I'd make think mine should be a favorite even on the road against Augsburg. So um, yeah, go going back to mines, baby. Plus one eighty. What what a ludicrous line that is. I mean, <laughs> what are we doing here? Like, seriously? Like, Augsburg is so, such an overperformer, so bad, should be in the relegation fight. And we've always talked about how much we love Mines. Obviously, that match against Dortmund got postponed because of COVID. I'm pretty sure all of Mines' cases are gone, and they're, they're going to be fine for this match. So, you know, for and that's on – I believe that's on Friday as well. So, I mean, what a beautiful Friday afternoon to take Mines. But I'm actually going Union Berlin, plus 105 at home against Stuttgart. This line for me is just way too low for an incredibly solid Union Berlin squad. They're one of the better defensive outfits in the Bundesliga, only 1.3 non-penalty expected goals allowed per match. The reason for that, they do not allow a ton of high-quality chances. They're third in the Bundesliga, conceding only 29 on the season. What's impressive about that, though, is they're actually not a big pressing team. They're dead last in the Bundesliga in passes per defensive action. They play out of either a 3-5-2 or a 5-3-2, which gives them a lot of solidity at the back but what it also means is they're very reliant on their wing backs getting forward to supply the attack and it shows in their numbers because they're second in the Bundesliga and crosses completed into the penalty area while Stuttgart is allowing the fifth most crosses in the league Stuttgart defensively has been a mess 17.6 expected goals allowed in their last 10 matches along with 17 big scoring chances they're second to last in the league in shots allowed per 90 fourth to last in expected goals allowed and third to last in box entries allowed. They, the last time these two teams met, Stuttgart absolutely stole a point. They got a red card. They were down one nothing, and they got a 93rd-minute goal. But Berlin outcreated them 1.2 to 0.5. So I have Berlin projected around minus 140. So at plus 105, I do like the value on them at home. Uh, all right. Uh, we'll go on to Syria. I, I'll be passing on the Italian league this weekend. What about you? Uh, Fiorentina. Bologna under two and a half goals at plus 115. When I saw this line, I was just like, what are we doing here? Like, are, are we being serious? Because the we, me and Anthony have talked about the overperformance in Italy and how just crazy these offenses are. Since Flahovic left for for Juventus, Fiorentina matches are only averaging around 2.5 total expected goals. Bologna is one of the more low event teams in Serie A. But it's a massive over, overperformance. Their matches are averaging 2.35 expected goals but if you look at actual goals they're averaging 2.74 so essentially Bologna is a very overrated offense and a very underrated defense which is a perfect 
recipe to bet on some regression by taking an under. Fiorentina is actually number one in Italy, Italy in shots allowed per 90 minutes, only around 9.3 on average. Bologna offensively has been pretty pathetic, only 0.93 non-penalty expected goals per match and only created 17 big scoring chances in 27 matches. So it's going to be difficult for them to break down one of the better defenses in Italy. Also, both these defenses are top four in Serie A in XG allowed per shot off of set pieces, which is really bad news for both offenses who have been incredibly reliant on set pieces and penalties to score goals. So I only have around 2.1 goals projected. So at under two and a half at plus 115, let's hope we can get some of that positive regression. Uh, onto La Liga. I like Athletic Club Bilbao plus 230 taking on Real Betis. Uh, Bilbao's on the road as a pretty big underdog, but I think it's another you know good matchup on a team that is generally underrated by the market. Um, Betis, Real Betis, they're not terribly good defensively. They're 15th in La Liga in big scoring chances allowed, 14th in non-penalty expected goals allowed. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Bilbao is top six in both of those metrics you flip it on the defensive side go is third in preventing big scoring chances and that's what you need to do against uh this real beta side who is sixth in big scoring chances allowed fourth in non-penalty expected goals per 90 so i think it's a good matchup for bill bow at a pretty big number and look they're like mines like brighton these are the type of teams you want to punch uh that you want to back to punch up as underdogs because they are solid uh in all three phases of the game what do you have for us in La Liga? Real Sociedad Alaves under two and a half goals at minus 120. The last time these two teams met, it was a really cagey one, one draw Only around two expected goals were created. And I'm expecting this, this, this time around as well. Real Sociedad, let's just be flat honest. They are not the offense. We expected them, them to be coming into the season ninth in non-penalty expected goals for match 13th in shots per 90 minutes, 17th in crosses completed into the penalty area. For a team that has Alexander Ishak and Mikel Olathabal, that is definitely not good enough. And Alaves, while they're not maybe one of the more better defensive teams in La Liga, they are horrific offensively. Bottom three in every single offensive metric, including averaging only 0.8 non-penalty expected goals per match. In fact, they've only created over one expected goal three times in their last 12 matches. So I'm expecting a pretty low event match here. I only have around two point. Uh, zero five goals projected. So uh, at a price of minus 120 on under two and a half goals, uh, I like the value on that. All right, uh, right back to you for League Un. Yeah, uh, Lens plus 105 on the road at Mets. Mets is, I think, maybe the worst team in the top five leagues. It's probably a battle between them and Salernitana in Italy. I mean, they are dead last in every single offensive metric. They've created all, only over one expected goal twice in their last 12 matches. Lens hasn't been in the best form in league on, but this is just a terrific matchup for them. Still top five in non-penalty expected goals, shots per 90 and big scoring chances allowed on the flip side, fifth uh, in all the important offensive metrics. It's a team that's due for a lot of positive regression just a good spot for them at a good price. I have them projected at minus 125. So at plus 105 on the money line, good price on lens. Get all three points at Mets. All right. Let's go on to our favorite underdogs. Anthony uh, has sent in his from a vacation, yeah. um, but for his underdog, he likes Wolfsburg there plus 245 on Saturday morning on the road, taking on Freiburg in the Bundesliga for me. Uh, I like Brighton. I talked about it. This is a team we like to back at big prices. And I know that they have struggled immensely over their past four matches. They're 0-0-4 win draw loss with a minus eight goal differential, only one goal scored. However, there is some positive regression coming from them offensively. And Liverpool right now are in some, I want to say bad form, but they're definitely showing some wobble to them. And I want to beat the market to them. They just, uh, to that wobble, I should say. It's, they, they just lost to Inter Milan at home, 1-0 in the Champions League. Uh, they've been playing a ton of soccer across a bunch of different competitions over the past three weeks. So a fatigued Liverpool is not uh, a, a, a fatigued team is not what you want to go into the Amex with to take on Brighton, a team that can press you and pass you off the park. So I'd like a buy low spot here on the Seagulls plus 550. They have played very well against Liverpool so far over the past two years. They're one one win, two, two draws against the Reds. So uh, a bogey side, if there ever was one for Jurgen Klopp's men. Brighton, plus 
plus 550 on Saturday morning, 7.30 a.m. Torino plus 390 at home against Inter Milan. This is a terrific matchup for Torino, especially being at home. It's a strength versus strength matchup. Inter is number one in every single offensive metric, but Torino is second in every single defensive metric behind only Napoli. And they're also the number one pressing team, as I mentioned many times, in Italy. Now, Inter is very good versus pressure, but they haven't seen, they really struggled the last time these two teams met. Inter won one nothing at the San Siro, but expected goals was only 1.3 to 0.6. Shots were even. Torino out-touched them in the penalty area. Possession was pretty even. Inter's defense is starting to trend a little bit in the wrong direction. They're now down to fifth in non-penalty expected goals allowed, fifth in big scoring chances allowed when near the beginning of the season when they were in their dominant form. They were number one in pretty much every that category, every single one of these defensive categories. So a really good spot here for a really underrated Torino team. I have them projected around only plus 250. So at plus 390, I think you're getting really good value on Torino to upset Inter Milan. Torino, Brighton, and Wolfsburg, you parlay those three teams together, and it's 109 to one. All right, uh, let's move on to our favorite bets for the weekend. I like Leeds United minus one and a half plus 143 against Norwich City. North City's 20th in non-penalty expected goals per 90, 20th in shots per 90, 20th in big scoring chances, and 18th in box entries per 90 minutes uh, the season. How do you beat Leeds United? You press them, excuse me, you play through their pressure and you take advantage of their leaky defense. And North City is as ill-equipped a team to do that as anybody in the Premier League. Plus, not knowing what they do on Thursday, a hand up, we're recording this before uh, Leeds is match on Thursday. However, they did show that they had some defensive improvements under Jesse Marsh in his debut. So I'm going to go with Leeds United back that improvement against North City. They are the type of team that could score in bunches. So if they do win, it's likely to come multiple goals. So I like chasing a minus one and a half. And if you're crazy, maybe minus two and a half or minus three and a half against North City. This should be a blowout. BJ, your favorite bet. Crystal Palace plus one and a half at even money at home. On Monday afternoon against league leaders Manchester City, Crystal Palace, the home road splits for them are pretty drastic this season. They're unbelievable team at home, fifth in the Premier League with a plus 8.8 expected goal differential. But more importantly, they've been really good against the big boys. In four matches against Tottenham, West Ham, Liverpool, and Chelsea, Crystal Palace has a plus 2.4 expected goal differential. And they actually handed Manchester City one of their three losses on the season back at the Etihad back in October. Chris Palace won 2 0. Manchester City did get a red card around the 45th minute, but Palace did hold them to 1.1 expected goals and only 14 shots, which is not a lot of teams can say this season. Manchester City has been in a little bit of weird form since the start of the new year. They only have a plus 0.88 uh, expected goal differential per 90 minutes, which sounds really good. But if you compare it to 2021, where they had a plus 1.83 expected goal differential per 90 minutes, their dip in form is actually starting to show on the pitch. So I love this spot here for Chris Palace, especially being at home. I have Manchester City spread projected only around minus 1.1. So I love the Eagles plus one and a half at even money. All right. Uh, that wraps up another episode of Wonder Goal. We will see you again on Monday morning with Anthony DeBundo back in town.